as you say, you know, the, the poorer countries of the world. India, for example, often uh, uses an example to promote vegetarian uh, eat, way of eating, uh, but actually um, <clears throat> a third of Indian kids uh, have growth retardation, are stunted, uh, and they've now cl got close to 100 million people with type 2 diabetes in the country. So clearly something's not working. There is change, I mean, and, and it's quite exciting. It's quite positive uh, what's going on. I was placed on the expert advisory group for the National Diabetes Strategy back in 2020, uh, back in 2020 actually, and that was published in 2021. I was able to get remission of type 2 diabetes into that document for the first time ever. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of things that have unfolded as, as a result of that. Uh, the, I think one of the, the, the next really powerful thing was that um, through, through 2023, actually, one of the low carb practitioners uh, in Adelaide, Laurie Laura Smith, and one of the endocrinologists, Dr. Steve Strength, he was the former past president of the Australian Diabetes Society, got together and wrote guidelines for remission using thera what we call therapeutic carbohydrate reduction, basically low carb. Uh, and that was um, endorsed by Diabetes Australia and Australian Diabetes Society back in uh, the early part of this year. So we're seeing this shift. Um, we had the parliamentary inquiry into diabetes late last year. The report's been released recently, and it's suggesting that we need to have more uh, promotion of low-carb diets for people with all types of diabetes, um, not just type 2 diabetes. So we're seeing this movement away uh, from the, the previous narrative. The dietary guidelines have to be, um, uh, the review has to go in line with the current evidence that, that saturated fat is is not bad for us, that red meat is not bad for us. In fact, they're, they're both critical for human health. So the dietary guidelines, um, actually most people probably not aware of the dietary guidelines, but they're actually very powerful. Uh, they're used to teach kids at school, they're used by cooks uh, in childcare all the way through to aged care. They're used by cooks in, in uh, prisons, in hospitals, in the defence force. They're used by uh, army of eye health educators, sorry, health educators and health um, uh, providers and, and the food industry and health policy makers. So they're actually very, very pervasive. So unless these, and everyone likes to use the dietary guidelines because they fear stepping outside the dietary guidelines, they might get reprimanded or punished or, or worse. Uh, so we have to see this change. So the dietary guidelines is a critical, a critical element to this. Uh, and there's another element which I think is is probably not equally as, as critical, but it has to be an accountability factor of the processed food industry and their predatory marketing. We have to remove the predatory marketing of the processed food industry, which I mentioned before. You know, uh, at supermarkets, uh, post offices. Um, office works, uh, chemist warehouse, you know, they all have, uh, they all have confectionery, chocolates, soft drinks, and their checkouts, you know, preying on people's vulnerabil vulnerabilities. So there's, there's lots of things. I've come up with a strategy, an action strategy, which involves three elements, awareness, accountability, and assistance. And awareness, quite simply, you know, some of the things we mentioned before, that, that um, we should be aware of these five A's of sugar toxicity that I mentioned, particularly the addictive element. We should be aware of the preventability and reversibility and the complications of type two diabetes. Accountability, um, we need accountability with respect to the, the, the guidelines, the technical marketing I mentioned, um, and the fact that all of these health bodies are using the guidelines and, and demonizing red meat. I mean, quite literally from the Heart Foundation through to the Cancer Council, they're all encouraging us to eat, consume less meat. Um, and also the uh, assistance element, which is uh, we need, GPs need assistance. Um, GPs need to understand how to use real food to reverse metabolic dysfunction. Most GPs are not even aware of this opportunity for remission. Uh, patients need assistance. Um, patients with metabolic dysfunction need assistance, particularly patients in lower socioeconomic areas. So they have access to subsidize consultations with dietitians and nutritionists. Uh, they might have access to subsidised uh, real food. Um, they might have access to CGM so they can see the impact of, of some particular foods, particularly cereal, cereals and grains and fruit juices and, and fruit and, and ultra processed foods on their blood sugar. So there's, there's a bunch more of other things that, I've, um, uh, that I could talk about, but uh, that's just give you an overview of what is needed. And, and uh, one of the things that's often touted as a tax on, on sugary drinks or a tax on sugary food. And initially that was one of my 
one of my many strategies. And all of these strategies have to happen at the same time. They can't actually happen independently because we won't have the impact. But I've moved away from this tax on sugary products to uh, suggest that what we should be doing is preventing the, uh, the um, tax breaks. Uh, for these various industries to market their unhealthy food at us, which amounts to about $5 billion every year. So you can imagine that $5 billion, if we're saving that, let alone the health costs uh, of, of uh, what's happening uh, as a result of these various foods and drinks, uh, that money could be put into some of those strategies I mentioned earlier about assistance. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'd, I'd agree with um, yeah, all of that, actually. Um, people, yeah, people don't understand just how um, powerful the, the dietary food guidelines really are. It, it's in all of our education. Like I studied sports science, and it was in my education too. Like we followed the guidelines, and it was um, very much you know lean, green, and marine sort of thing. Like lean meats and low fats. Keep it, stay away from the saturated fats and calorie restriction. You know, move more, eat less. That sort of ridiculous nonsense. Um, which unfortunately I fell for for a long time. Um, and most, but, most medical practitioners and health practitioners still fall for it. They still have no that's idea. Right. That, that's right. And they have less education on um, diet than pretty much anyone. GPs, doctors, they don't do anything really about nutrition. But yeah, uh, recently... Just to interrupt you for a moment, my, son was, my son's in sixth year medicine at the moment. He was in second year medicine when he had the opportunity to do nutrition as an elective. So it's not even compulsory in our major training ground. So this is something that we've been you know, doing is um, getting nutrition and particularly metabolic health uh, into the curriculum of um, medical schools across the country. We've now met with uh, the curriculum uh, uh, academic staff in about a quarter of our medical schools now, uh, encouraging them to incorporate this into the curriculum. It's really important. Yeah. Uh, we've also met with Dietitians Australia, uh, and we've now have a 10 module course, which is currently running for dietitians and nutritionists uh, to give them this education that they're not getting uh, in their core training. Yeah, yeah that's great too. Um, again, that depends on what they're teaching them as well. Um, you know, the, uh, like the Dietetics Association of America was originally founded by the uh, like Kellogg's and um, the the sanitarium group. So, uh, which, like you said, we talk about tax breaks. They they pay no taxes. You know, sanitarium in Australia pay zero tax because they're a religious organisation. Um, who promoting, yeah, promoting a vegan anti red meat diet? Exactly. Yeah, and oh, no. that, you know, an ideological base of a highly processed plant-based diet, so um, which is just, you know, as we said before, just insane, really. Um, but yeah, there, there needs to be accountability. Um, the and I think there should be accountability for individuals as well. Uh, take control of their own health uh, makes a big difference um, to educate ourselves. But when you're talking about uh, I just, on that note, just on that note, you know, I, um, back in 2021, once remission was in the National Diabetes Strategy, I started chatting to my patients with type 2 diabetes, but only the ones initially who I was actively treating with sight threatening retinal disease due to their diabetes. I was actually putting needles in their eyes on a regular basis, performing laser treatment. Only one of that first hundred even was even aware of the opportunity for reversing or putting their type 2 diabetes into remission. So I, I, I got up the courage. I never thought it was my role. I was the guy at the end of the line treating the end stage complications. I never thought I was the guy that, that would have these conversations about diets with my patients. But the, one of the things that I heard over and over again, when I say, oh, let's, let's just talk about what you're eating. Oh, doc, I'm eating well. I'm eating lots of cereals and grains, lots of fruit and veg, not much meat. We, I heard that time and time again. Uh, so it's this high carb eating approach, which is actually completely inappropriate for people who are carbon intolerant who have metabolic dysfunction. So they think they're doing the right thing. They think they're doing the right thing. They've been told that that's the way they eat. They should be eating. They've been told that repeatedly. And yeah. uh, it's, it's actually not good. There's no evidence whatsoever to show that the current high-carb eating pattern can prevent type 2 diabetes, let alone reverse it. 